السلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين. I'll start out with a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these are some hadith that I, <coughs> that as I come across and I find that they have a, a connection to Bidr al-Wadidin, to the subject of respecting parents and the rights of parents, I just write them into the book, into the, the, the notes that I've been taking. So in the first one, narrated by, uh, in, in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, الرحم متعلقة بالعرش تقول من وصلني وصله الله ومن قطعني قطعه الله. The rahim, the womb, or the the uh, the connection that's created by the womb, the rahim, like the sulit of rahim, that the, the kinship bonds, says or is is connected to the arsh, is connected to the the rahim is connected to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and it says. Whoever connects to me, Allah will connect to them. And whoever cuts me, Allah will cut them off. And this is enough of a reminder to us of the importance of Silatul Rahim and the importance of, of connecting, of maintaining that bond. And this is in general, whether it's the parents or otherwise, but it starts with the parents. The second one, according, uh, narrated by uh, Sahih al Bukhari. <clears throat> And this hadith gives us an understanding of what Silatul Rahim means. Because sometimes when, when you see a translation of Silatul Rahim, what do we see it translated as? Ties, what do you see it translated? Ties of kinship. What's that? Ties of kinship. Ties of kinship. But what, what are we doing? I mean, because that's just a noun, there's no verb. Like, what do we have to do with the ties? What's that? Good. Connecting. Isn't that what we would say? Or have you, who's, who have, who's ever seen it or heard it as maintaining kinship bonds? Have we seen that sometimes or heard it speaking? Sometimes it's translated as maintaining kinship bonds. And other times I've seen, I personally have seen it less translated as, but as you mentioned, connecting. The actual making of a connection between the kinship bonds. And this next hadith narrated by in Sahih Bukhari <clears throat> will clarify to us what does Silatul Rahim Connecting the, the, the bonds of kinship, what does it actually mean? An Abdullah ibn Umar, An Abdullah ibn Amr, radiallahu anhu, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قال, <coughs> on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ليس الواصل, ليس الواصل بالمكافي, ولكن الواصل الذي إذا قطعت رحمه وصلها. The person who maintains the kinship bonds, or the, the wasif, so if we say silatul rahim is the noun, the person who does that action is the wasif. He's the one who's doing the wusul. He's connecting in that, with that kinship bonds. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the one who connects is not the one who um, returns, uh, returns the favor. Or, or, or gives, basically, it's like an equal exchange. The mukafit is the equal exchange. The wasil is not the one who does the equal exchange. The wasil is the one who, when his bond is cut with him, he goes and connects. So think about that in our families. I think every one of us can, can just think about your families. Uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, grandparents, grandchildren. Somewhere in your family, there's somebody, either with you, or with other members of your family, there's some people who are not talking with each other. Right? I think we can all relate to that. It's a human condition. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is treating as a doctor the ills of all society. So it's a human condition, the, the qata of the rahm. We can all relate to that. We've all seen that. We've heard stories. Maybe we've experienced that. Somebody has cut us off, or we've cut them off for whatever reason, valid or invalid. And usually, the people who are in this, on both sides, if you talk to them, they feel, I have a right you know, to, to not speak to that person because of what they said to me. Okay, well, how can we fix this? I don't need to fix it, they should come to me. That's in a situation where there's discord in the family. But then there's other people who have, you have, and hopefully for the majority of the family, you have a good relationship and a good interaction and you see them on Eid and 
you see them at dinners, and you see them at uh, uh, family reunion type things. <clears throat> and we may fool ourselves, trick ourselves into thinking that maintaining relationship with the people who are maintaining with us, that's Silat al -Rahim. You say, oh, we have to go visit them at Eid because of Silat al -Rahim. Well, did they cut you off? No, we're just, they visited us, so we visit them. They invited us, so we invite them. A lot of cultures, right? You start counting up in Ramadan. Okay, who invited us last year? Now we gotta invite them back this year. And when it comes time to the weddings, oh, who gave us on our daughter's wedding this much? We have to give on their daughters, right? We're, it's, an, it's almost an equal exchange. But think about a person who came to your wedding or a family member's wedding, didn't bring you any gift, and you still gave them $100. That's the Sinat al When a person cuts you off, doesn't work in an equal exchange with you, and you go above and beyond and do something for them. So with the family members who we are <clears throat> maintaining the Silat al-Rahim, that's also an obligation. It's also an obligation, so we shouldn't dis discount that. But we should not think that Silat al-Rahim, this high um, station that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is calling us to, is that equal exchange. It's for the person who cuts us off. It's for the person who disrespects us. It's for the person who does not fulfill our right, and then we go to make that connection. <clears throat> they say one of the examples is, you know, there's a, there's a hadith, a famous hadith, where the Prophet Sallallahu said that there's a tree in the desert that resembles the believer. And all of the Sahaba, all of these grown men, not a one of them could understand what, what tree is he talking about. Because the, even though it's a desert, there's still trees. There's trees in the desert like the Siddur. Has anybody ever uh, eaten nabaq from the Siddur tree? The, um, it's like a, almost like a, <clears throat> a little berry from a desert uh, type tree. In Yemen, anybody from Yemen here, they have a very expensive honey that comes from the Siddur tree. Um, so the Siddur has thorns, and it's interesting. Look it up on the internet. Look up Lot tree, L-O-T-E. You know when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made Isra al Mi'raj, Sidrat al Muntaha, it's named after the same tree that's in the earth, the Sidr. But on earth, the tree is, it has uh, its thorns, one is straight and one is curved. It looks just like the perfect barbed wire. In fact, the Bedouins, and I've seen this in Mauritania in the desert, they'll cut the branches of this tree to make a, a fence around the goats. The, the wolves can't get in there. It's so, uh, it's, it's dangerous. I've actually put clothes on the tree to dry them off when we've been washing them in like in a lake or a river. When you try to pull your clothes off, it starts ripping. Like it's, it's almost like barbed wire or razor wire. That's the sidin. It also produces a very nice um, fruit. But when the Arabs heard in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, fi sidrin makhdud, right? One of the Arabs said, uh, Ya Rasulullah, is Allah going to reward us in Jannah with a shajara tadurru bi sahibiha? Like the person who owns or, or interacts with this tree, you're gonna get harmed if you try to pick its fruit. It'll it'll pick up, it'll cut you to shreds. And the Arab said, what, "What is that one?" He said, "Didn't you hear what Allah said? Fi sidrin, mahdud, meaning a sidr with no thorns. So not just any sidr, a sidr with no thorns. And one of the most amazing things that I saw with the sidr is the camels would come to the sidr tree." And you know how like we take a bunch of grapes, if it's small grapes, and you put them in your mouth and you pull it, and you just pull the stems out? I've seen, wallahi, I've seen camels come to the Siddur tree with this barbed wire thorn, put, grab a whole branch full, and just pull all of the leaves, and it doesn't cut any of its mouth. That's why when Allah tells us, Look at this amazing creation, the camel. Which some people, some of the Orientalists, they say this is a proof that this is not a universal message. Because how would somebody in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, how would they relate to the camel? Well, two things. One is the camel is a, a unique and amazing animal wherever in the world you are. If you study it, and you look at what it can do. But the second thing is the principle that Allah is teaching us, look at these amazing creatures which within your ecosystems, and it doesn't have to be the camel. That's just an example. Look at all of the creatures around you. So getting back to the tree question, the Arabs had trees in the desert. The Prophet ﷺ asked them, there's a tree in the desert that resembles the believer. What is it? None of them could answer. But who, who knew the answer? Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah, the son of Umar, but he was a young boy. 
And so, just like we see, you know, most kids with adab, they don't want to speak up in a gathering of adults. Out of adab, maybe out of haba, they're a little bit shy, a little bit scared. So afterwards, he told, he told his father, he says, I knew what the tree was. It's the palm tree, the date palm tree. And he said, why didn't you say it? Because then when the Prophet didn't find an answer, he said, he said it's the date palm tree, sallallahu alayhi wa And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, I knew what it was. He said, why didn't you speak up? I would, it would have made me so proud to have my son answer this question that all of the Sahaba, with some of the elders of the Sahaba, they couldn't get. So we look at the date palm tree. I asked one of my, uh, uh, one of my teachers, we were actually in a date palm uh, grove or garden, and it was when they, they eat the fresh dates before they become dates. They're like, bef like before a raisin is a raisin, you can eat a grape, the same thing with the dates, the betah. Does anybody like to eat betah? We just finished the season right now, um, in August and September in California. <clears throat> so I asked him, as we're looking at the, the trees, I said, what is it? So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what is it, um, uh, uh, but I'm asking, I said, what is it about the tree that, that we are like? He said, oh, it's a lot of things. He said, one of the things is that the, the date palm tree, it doesn't like a lot of water, and it doesn't like very nutritious soil. The harsher the soil, and the, like it needs enough water. It needs water to grow. It can't like, it's not one of those drought resistant trees that can go without water for years. No, it needs water, but if you water it too much, just like any tree, but even in the desert, the, 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 the day palm, it won't do good. And if the soil is too good, if there's not enough sand and rocks, the dates won't be as sweet. So the harsher the environment, the sweeter the dates. How does that sound like the believer? The other thing is there's so many benefits that come out of a tree, out of a date palm. Not just the dates, but there's the dates and then the date seeds. There's people who will actually take the date seeds and crush them up and it becomes food for the, the, the cows or the donkeys. The uh, roofs out of it, out of the palm trunk, uh, fronds. The, the actual trunk of the tree, you can use it in, in construction. Who's ever seen a building that has like palm fronds in it or palm trunks in it? If you go to some countries, usually in the, in the deserts, they still build with it. Uh, at one, um, uh, the other thing is there's a type of, um, uh, it's like the, the fibers of the tree, the, the Sahaba would, would wash their, their dishes with that. They would scrub their bodies with it. So you know like the loofah sponge? It's like that, but it's made out of the, the, uh, the, the date palm tree. So here's a business idea I thought about. Uh, like in that. So somebody gets those palm fibers and organic, fair trade, certified, non-GMO, all of that, and then sell some natural body scrubbing materials. Um, and um, what other things? Um, they use some of the, 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 the fronds when they fall off, they use them for cooking. There's a lot of benefits. And then I read one time they said, look at the palm tree, because when you throw rocks at it, what happens, what is the date given response? It's not like the, uh, the trees from the Wizard of Oz. Remember Dorothy tried to pick an apple? They started throwing the apples to, to hurt them. But if you throw a stick at a palm tree, and it has dates, and you throw rocks at a, 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 date, a, palm, a palm tree, what is it going to give you? Dates. Dates, something good. And so that's another way the believer should be like the palm tree. When somebody throws sticks at us, or stones, we can respond like mukafa'a, equal for equal, tit for tat. But we can also say, I'm going to go to a higher level. So how does that relate to uh, uh, Surat al-Rahm? When somebody cuts us off and cuts and tries to, to, to destroy the kinship bond, the Rahm between us, we shouldn't take the, 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 the attitude of, well, they're not calling me, I'm not going to call them. They're not respecting me, I shouldn't respect them. They're not make, maintaining the kinship bonds with me, so I'm not going to maintain the kinship bonds with them. So with that, we'll go into, as it relates to Bidu um, Walidain. <clears throat> and last week we spoke about obeying them, which one is greater, the mother or the father, because we began, the first few weeks we're talking about the importance of respecting the parents, obeying the parents as a, as a group. And although it's important for them to work as a team, <clears throat> what happens when they don't? What happens when one parent, the mother, asks the child to do one thing, and the father asks for something else? <clears throat> or what happens when the parents see one thing for the children, I want you to do this, and the child, especially once they become older, 
um, don't, doesn't want to do that. And where does that come to head a lot of times? When it comes to marriage. So now let's talk, see what the ulama have said about obedience and respect of the parents as it relates to marriage. So Muhammad Maulud says, um, <clears throat> he discusses that one of the, one of the ulama looked at all of the, the, kind of did a survey of the ahadith that relate to obedience to the parents as it relates to marriage <clears throat> and what the ulama have said about that. So the first situation is the parents tell the child, tell the son, sorry. Tell the, so there's two different things. There's the parents telling the son, there's the parents telling the daughter. So the first thing is, if the parents tell the son, I don't want you to marry so-and-so, a specific person. Like, so the parents say, he says here, Sulayma, as an example. So the parents tell their son, look, I know you want to get married. It's okay, we encourage it, we want you to get married. And you have an interest in Sulayma, don't marry her. But you can marry anybody else. So he said, if this is the situation, then some of the ulama, some of the ulama, and there's also fiqh, you have a lot of difference of opinion. Some of the ulama say he has to obey them in that situation. Because they didn't come and say, don't get married at all. They just said this one specific person. Now before we start thinking of, of other scenarios and questions, let's just get through this whole, um, uh, the, all these scenarios, and what are the different uh, opinions in them. Now, if he, if they say, if they, if they tell, if they tell the son, don't get married at all. We don't want you to get married. Then at that point, he does not have to obey them because now they're asking for something unreasonable. So earlier, when we were talking about obedience to the parents, we said a lot of it hinges on they're not ordering us to do something haram, they're not ordering us to do something harmful, and the order to be able to do it is actually reasonable. So. For the average Muslim, average human being for that matter, leaving marriage would be, would be harmful to them. So the parents can't come and they can't say, I don't want you to get married at all. No more marriage. They don't have that right because that's unreasonable. But if they say, look, there's a lot of people, you have interest in a couple different people, just not that person. For, for whatever reason. According to some of the ulama, they say you have, to, uh, you have to obey them in that question. Now, the third situation is what if the child is already married and the parent says, I want you to divorce your wife to the son. There's a hadith, <clears throat> and now the majority of the ulama say he does not have to obey her. And um, uh, Imam al-Haythami, Ibn Hajar al-Haythami, who's one of the famous muhaddithin, he mentioned this opinion as the, from the Shafi'i school. And this is the opinion of the Shafi'i school, this is the opinion of the Maliki school and others as well, that he does not have to obey them. Because now this is something, when we look at marriage, marriage is something that's very sacred. And breaking the bonds of marriage is very, um, should only be done under the, the most serious situation. So we know the hadith, the most hated of the halal to Allah is divorce. So out of all of the halal, the closest thing to being haram. It's not haram. We're not like the Christians who believe till death do us part. And that was the sharia of Isa. And if you study the split of the, the Christian church, the foundational matter that a lot of churches split on was this. They're like, we have to have a way out. Some marriages don't work out. And so the sharia of Isa, the sharia law of Isa, and I know this is going online, Isa had a sharia law. Moses had a sharia law. Uh, Yusuf had a sharia law. They all had sharia laws, sharia laws. The Prophet وسلم, Sharia allows for divorce, but it's the most hated of, of, of the halal. There's a hadith that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that in the morning, Iblis has his throne, or he has his throne on the oceans. And in the morning, he sends out his demons. And he tells them, the one who does the worst thing, when you come back in the evening, will get to sit right next to me. So they go out, spread their mischief and their corruption. They come back in the evening, he starts asking them, what did you do? The first person says, I got a person to drink alcohol. He says, no, not you. I got a person to gamble. No, not you. I got a person to kill, to murder. No, not you. He said, I separated between a husband and his wife. He said, yes, you. Come sit next to me. Now, when you look at it, murder, theft, alcohol, those are all things that are haram in and of themselves. But the actual act of divorce is not haram. But most of the time, the things that lead up to the actual divorce is filled with haram. Cursing, fighting, and bank home, belittling, humiliation, all of these things. 
And that's one of the interpretations that the ulama said about this hadith. Abhadul halali ila Allah al The most hated of the halal to Allah is the talaq. And they had to ask this question, well, we know one of the definitions of haram is that it is the thing that Allah hates. And what is something that's halal? Something that Allah does not hate. So how could Allah hate the halal? So they looked at this, they gave it an interpretation. They said, yes, Allah does not hate the halal. But all of the things, so the actual act of divorce is halal. But everything that leads up to divorce is usually is filled with haram. And so that's what Allah is saying, that, or the Prophet is telling us that Allah hates. So because we have this, the most hated of the halal is, the halal, uh, is, is, is divorce. The most beloved thing to, to Iblis is divorce. Uh, and with the disclaimer that in some situations, divorce is actually an obligation. Sometimes, whatever is better for the person, that's the path they have to choose. But now we're talking in general. So if we know this is the state status of divorce in Islam, if the parents come to the child and they say, I want you to divorce, they're asking them for something that's very, very difficult and very, very problematic. And so the ulama said, no, you don't have to obey them. Some of the ulama have said, yes, you do have to obey them. And they use as a hadith a situation where Umar ibn al-Khattab told his son, one of his sons, And I'll, I can, if I can find the name, but one of his sons had married a woman, and Abdullah uh, uh, Umar ibn Khattab told his son, "Divorce your wife." And so he really he didn't want to divorce her, so he went to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's in a situation, a difficult situation. He told the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "My father has a, has a, has told me to divorce my wife." So then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Divorce your wife." Now some of the ulama said this is a proof that the father or the parent has the right if they, to tell their child if they feel that there's benefit in this to suggest divorce. The other ulama responded, no, 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 no. That's not what's going on in this hadith. What's going on in this hadith is this is Umar ibn al-Khattab. This is Umar ibn Farooq. This is Umar who the Prophet said about him, alaykum bi sunnati. Follow my sunnah and what else? And the sunnah of the righteously guided khulafa bin ba'di that come after me, including Umar. This is Umar who many times, there's actually one thing that Umar has, it's, a, it's specific to him amongst the sahaba, it's called the muwafaqat. There were a number of times where he mentioned something and there was no clear uh, wahi at the time, but Umar's opinion was actually in line with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was going to reveal to them. A couple of examples. After the battle of Badr, there were some prisoners taken. The Prophet ﷺ now gets two advice. Keep them as POWs and ransom them or execute them. What did Abu Bakr advise? Ransom. What did Umar advise? Execute. And he said not only execute, but have every member of the Muslims who that's their relative, they execute their relative to show this is, this is Iman is the dividing between us. There's no more tribal connections. The Prophet Sallallahu went with Abu Bakr's choice and then later Allah had said, it was not befitting for you to take the, the, the prisoners of war, you should have executed them. So Umar's insight was actually in line with the wahi that was about to come. It's not that he had wahi. And I'll give some more ex examples of this and, and explain it more after the salah. But Qari Amr is here and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll break for the salah to the nation. So just to use the last 20 minutes to finish up this very important um, topic. So we were we left off on discussing on the muwafaqat of Umar. And just to give you a couple more examples of the muwafaqat. Right here with It's fine. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, one time, the Umar عنه, was with the Prophet وسلم, and they were eating, and Aisha was right there. Aisha and Umar told the Prophet وسلم, he said, I don't think it's befitting that your wives are able to interact with the men of the community, and he's talking about himself first and foremost, with, without a barrier in between them. In, in between us, I think it would be more be, it would be more befitting that your wives are not only wear hijab but also speak from behind the hijab. And then the ayah of hijab came down, 
And so it's not that Allah is revealing it because of Umar. And it's not that Umar has wahi because wahi, revelation, is only something that the prophets have. But it's, it's something that the, the, the insight of Umar, he could see something that would later be confirmed by revelation. So again, it's not wahi, and it's not that Allah is doing it because Umar uh, had that feeling. The ayah of hijab. When the if happened, when the lie against our mother Aisha anha came, and people started spreading the slander about Aisha, we know that the majority of the, uh, of the believers, they rejected it. Some of the believers believed it and spread the, 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 the lie. And they were punished later for that with 80 lashes each. And then some of the people were in doubt, uh, maybe, maybe not. But Umar, when he heard it, what did he say? The first thing, when he heard the news of the slander, the first thing that he said was, Subhanaka hadha buhtan azim. Where else do we see that? That's the exact words that are mentioned in the Quran. The exact words. When Umar when he heard the the the, the you know the verses of embryology that we all mention to, to prove the, the scientific miracle of the Quran, when he heard those verses, the very clear ones, you know, there was a alaqa and then a mudra and all of this. At the end, he said, What was the next ayah that was revealed? So Umar had, he was on a different wavelength than most people. He had insight. He had, when he was a Khalifa, one time he was standing on the mimbar, giving a khutbah, and recently before that, he had sent out a Muslim by the name of Sariya. And Sariya was sent out on a, a, as, a, as a leader of a battle leader of a, of a, a group of, of, of Muslims, they engaged in the battle. During the battle, Umar could see in the khutbah, while he was in Medina, he could see that the enemy were coming around the mountain. And he could see that Sadia, the general of that army, was not paying attention to that, uh, that, that, that mountain, and they were about to be ambushed. And so during the khutbah, he's saying, Alhamdulillah al-wahid al-ajal, alladhi la sharika lahu wa la mathal. Ya Sariyat al-Jabal 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 And when Sariya came back, he said, I heard the voice of Umar. And this was confirmed by all the Sahaba. So this is not just some, some hearsay that happened. This was confirmed by all the Sahaba who were present that Sariya heard the voice and others heard the voice. And then they confirmed it to Umar. And Umar was in the midst of giving the khutbah. He just, he, he, he called out to Sariya and he made it rhyme with the rest of the khutbah. Alhamdulillah al-Wahid al-Ajal. الذي لا شريك له ولا مثل يا سارية الجبل 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 the mountain the mountain the mountain he looked over and he saved the army so now this is Umar if he tells his son Abdullah to divorce his wife do you see why the messenger of Allah said yeah I can I'm confirming the judgment it's basically like the supreme court is the messenger of Allah and the ninth district court is, the, is Umar anhu, and the Supreme Court is just confirming the lower court's decision, yes. Because do we think that Umar would be telling his son to divorce his wife because of a cultural reason? Do we think that Umar would tell his wife to divorce, his son to divorce his son's wife because of, uh, because of a nafs issue? That Umar had it like a nafsi issue? He didn't. Umar said when he, as a Muslim, he never went to any of his wives with the intention of shahwa. He said, I wanted somebody to be mujahid fi sabilillah. That was Umar. He wasn't even th he wasn't thinking on the realm of, of nefs and culture and shahwa. Umar was the person who, he imagine, he's walking to the Messenger of Allah to assassinate him. The story happens, he becomes Muslim. The next thing he says, why are we worshiping in private? Let's go worship at the Kaaba. And him and Asadullah Hamza, went to worship at the Kaaba. They said from the day Umar became Muslim, Islam great, gained in dignity and respect and honor amongst the people. And once Umar was, was assassinated, it's, it's been going down ever since. So this is Umar. So the reason why it's important to mention this is because if, some, if a parent comes and says, well, you know what, as a parent, I have the right to tell my son to divorce because of this hadith. We say, no, 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 you have to understand the context of the hadith. And this is what has been confirmed by the ulama. So we have those, situ those three situations. If the parent says a specific person, the son has to obey. If the person, if the parent says in general, the son doesn't have to obey because it's unreasonable. 
and divorce doesn't have to obey. Now one thing I will say about this specific person is we don't have to look at this as absolute because nowadays the halal has become so difficult to attain and marriage is one of the most difficult things that is afflicting our, our, our societies. It's very difficult to find two Muslims who are both practicing, who identify as their, in their religion, practice in their religion, want to get married, and are compatible. You see how many levels we have to go through? And in this day and age, where the haram is so easy. The haram is so easy. And so we have all of these levels, and if finally a young Muslim man finds somebody that he's compatible with, and his parents tell him no, then that's where we would say, well, even though there is some precedent, some legal ruling to say you have the right, that's all based on reason. And if it's unreasonable, if it's an unreasonable request, then we don't have to, uh, you don't have to obey it as the son. Now, this is not talking about the daughter. The daughter, it's a different set of rulings. And for all of us who are men here and have daughters in our care, we're the awliya. By sharia, Allah has placed the wilaya, their guardianship, under our guard. But the wali does not mean you're the supreme leader, like the North Korean leader calls himself, right? It's not, it's not the supreme leader. It's not the dictator. It's not authoritarian. What does a wali mean? What does wali mean? What does it come from? What does the word come from? Wali Amr is the, is the, it's another, it's another version of it. But wali, what does it mean? What is, or what's the translation that maybe we've seen of wali? Protector. A protector. Allah is the wali of, the, of those who believe. He's the protector, the protecting friend, some translations put it as. So the wali is the one who protects those in his charge. The wali and amr should be protected. The parent should be protected. So when it comes time for marriage, it's not, oh, do you just for whatever reasons, nefsi reasons, selfish reasons, cultural reasons, you like or dislike this choice for marriage for your daughter or for your son? Are you have to see what's in her best interest. And that's what we guard. That's what we as the wali we guard. We guard her best interest. Now there's a certain level of conflict of interest because we're the parent and sometimes, you know, a, a parent couldn't be, shouldn't, uh, we have a couple um, people in the medical professionals here. Yeah, no, there was one brother. Okay, if you're a surgeon, should you operate on your relative? If you're a lawyer, should you take, uh, you know, you can't be a jury on somebody that's really, they look for these conflicts of interest. There's things in the government. You know, there's all this conflict of interest. So at one level, there's a certain level of conflict of interest that you're the parent, but at the same time, the thing that outweighs is that you have more care and concern for this person, and, or we should have that, for the betterment of her state, that when a situation comes, we can put aside the conflict of interest, which here's the conflict of interest. My nefs, my own personal uh, reasons for liking or disliking the situation, and hey, I'm your father, I'm the wali, bitter wali ding, or bukul wali ding, and now I'm going, that, that's the conflict of interest. So that was, that's what we have to put to the side. And we have to say, I'm gonna put aside my nefs, and I'm gonna put aside my possible cultural reasons for disliking or liking or something, and say, what is in her best interest? And so if a person comes to uh, propose to our daughter and we see that it's in her best interest, as the wedding, we do not have the right to prevent that. That's what the wedding does. He has to, in, he has to ensure that, that he, he, he only lets in what's, what's, what's beneficial to her. But once that situation comes, then he, can't, he cannot stop it. And according to the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, that if a person who you accept their deen proposes to your daughter and you reject it, what will happen? Chaos. Chaos in the land. Corruption in the land. And that's what we have. That's what we have a lot of times because the parents are getting so involved in their son's choices of marriage, they're getting too involved in their daughter's choices of marriage, and now we have people that don't even get married. Because of all this. The haram is right outside our doors, brothers and sisters. It's right outside our doors. It's on the phones. And then we're going to sit here and we're going to say, in 2019, oh, no, 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 not this one. 
Okay, now she's 21, 24, 25, 35, 36, 39. What's going on? And then, um, so we have to take all of those things into consideration. If the father prevents a good situation, he actually has a new term. He's no longer the wali. He's a mu'adil, according to the fuqaha. He gets a new title. The title is mu'adil, which means a preventer of something good. And so if the daughter now gets another proposal, and the, the, the father rejects it, she can go to the qadi, or a group of Muslims who fulfill the, the position of the qadi, and she can have them marry her in their place. They become the wedding. They can look at the situation and say, is this a beneficial situation or not? So we, do, we shouldn't think that just because we're the wedding, biologically, that it's absolute. No, it's a position with the specific requirements. We're there to make, to protect her and make sure that we're we facilitate that. If we prevent it, we're now giving up our wilaya rights. She can either go off and get married on her own, according to some of the ulama, or she gets another wali from amongst the Muslims of the, of the community. Now, I'm not giving this as implemental advice. It should everything, if a person's in that situation, they should always seek consultation of, of that. But it's also important to know because in this context, we're talking about rights of parents, respect of parents, obeying of parents. And this is in a lot of families where it comes to head. The daughter's like, this is what I want. Or the son says, this is what I want. And now the parents are preventing something good from happening. And they're citing, you have to respect me. Remember, you were at the halakas. You studied the book. You listened to the lectures. It says, no, no, that's not where, that's not where, uh, it, it, that, that's not where the rule uh, goes into. So for... Um, also for the for for telling the daughter to divorce. So we said we had the discussion about the ulama had to discuss this because that hadith exists that the Prophet told Abdullah ibn, uh, the, the son of Umar to, to divorce his wife. And so we have to discuss that. We said can the parent tell the son? And the majority of ulama said no. For the daughter, there's no difference of opinion. Nobody can suggest divorce to the woman. Because one of the worst things that a person can do, it's called the mukhallaq, which he comes to a woman, or some person comes to a woman and says, oh, you know what, your husband's not this, and he's not, you know, basically does waswasa, does waswasa to the person, whispering to the person, and changes their opinion about staying in, in, the, in the marriage. So that's one of the worst things that can happen. So those are the, um, the rules on obedience of parents. I'll leave the last five minutes for questions. I know I opened up a very, very uh, sensitive topic, which is obedience as it, uh, uh, as it relates to, to, to marriage. But I think it's also something that we as a community should all know and realize because there's going to be situations where people come and ask our advice and they say, you know what, my daughter wants to get married and I don't want it. And then you as a person who they're asking for advice, you might have to bring some sense to the situation. Maybe. Maybe what he said, his judgment is right. Maybe she thinks it's a good marriage, and he and and after a couple other people look at it, it says it's not. I was there was um, there's situations where I've been called upon to look at a, a situation, and I've looked at it and I said, even though the woman wants to get married, he said, no, 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 this is not good for you. This is not healthy. But one of the ways that we can kind of balance that out is we get multiple people involved, and so if three or four or five people all independently look at that situation and say, hmm. I don't think it's the best situation. If we get four or five upstanding Muslims from our community, men and women, to look at a situation, and if they all agree with the parents, well then in that situation, most probably the parents are right. So you might be part of that committee, you might be part of that advisory committee. And so, and it's not necessarily something official, but it's something that people in the community come up to you and says, my son wants to get married, my daughter wants to get married, I am refusing. Now you might have to be one of those people that looks in, and this is not something that necessarily takes a lot of ilm or knowledge, it just takes sincerity. You have to look at the situation, and you have to see, is this beneficial for this person's deen? Is this something that's good for them? And if it is, why are we stopping it? Um, um, some people might say, like one of the situations, a young young person wants to get married, young man wants to get married, his parents say, no, 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 wait till you finish college, and wait till you get a job, and I don't want you to get married till you do this, this, and this, and this, and that, that, right? So even though they're not telling him, don't get married, essentially by putting up all these roadblocks, they're telling him, don't get married. If he comes around, he's 21, he wants to get married, he says, I want to get married, they're like, no, you need to finish college, you need to get a job, you need to be stable in your career, maybe go to master's, do graduates, but like, what are you waiting, telling, you're telling me wait 10 years, essentially. 
don't get married for 10 years. And that's very, very problematic. There's studies, um, look this up, jot it down on your phones. It's called the FYI Institute, Family Youth Institute. Right now on your phones, like just, just type it in, Family Youth Institute, and just put in FYI Islam, it should come up. If you type in FYI Islam. This is a group out of Ohio that's doing a lot of good work and they, you should sign up for their newsletters as well. Um, you can sign up for their newsletter. They send out very, I think if you type in FYI Islam. Yeah, so if you, if you do a, a Google search for FYI Islam, it'll come up there. Is it showing up? For those of you that looked. The Family and Youth Institute. They got a lot of resources to help families. And one of the things they do is they do research about the status of Muslims, young Muslims, older Muslims, and what's going on. So one of the research they did was on Muslim on campuses. They went out just a couple of years ago, talked to Muslim youth on the campuses today. They talked about drug use, alcohol use, illicit relationships, you know, and so forth, and all of these other things. And do you know the percentage of the Muslim youth on campuses that are using drugs and alcohol? Percentage-wise. And they're, this is through published research data. 20%? 40. 40? 40, 50. It's 50%. So think of the Muslim. Now we're not talking about the Muslims who are coming to the masjid necessarily. The Muslims, it's not all Muslims. Somebody might start looking around and be like, you talking about these? The, the youth who are in the masjid, they're in a different category. We're talking about all of the Muslims who are on campus. Some of them, some of their families don't even know where the masjid is, right? So it's all of the Muslims. The, there's also the people who engage in zina. What's the percentage of that on, Muslim, on campuses today? This is, again, this is not hearsay, oh, no, no, this is like surveys, research, published data. It's available on their website. What's that statistic? How many, who, what'd you say? 60%? 75%? Well, it's actually a little lower than that, so it's about 50. But they have it, they have it as a, but that's still high. That means one in every two Muslims on campus. Now these are the same Muslims, they go back to their Baba, their Mama, their Abu, their, you know, whatever the title is they're given there. I want to get married. No, 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 wait. And this is the reality that's on our campuses. So if a person is in this situation, if they come to me and they say, I want to get married, and, I'm, uh, and my parents are telling me, no, automatically I'm saying, okay, it's most probably ir irrational, ir uh, unreasonable, but let's investigate, let's speak to your parents, let's see what, it, what is the actual, and sometimes, some of the, the, the concerns are, are, are valid and fair, and we have, to, we have to ask, but you might be in a situation where you might have to tell your friend or your cousin or your brother or your uncle, hey, let your daughter get married. She wants to get married. She wants the halal. Now you're going to prevent her from marrying a good Muslim man and expect corruption. Of so you know the hadith that I mentioned that the Prophet said, if you refuse suitable men to marry your daughters, this includes the fathers, the mothers, the girls themselves, because sometimes the girls refuse for unreasonable reasons. If you refuse, expect corruption in the earth, and now we have the 50% statistic. Isn't that corruption? We have 50% alcohol, 50% 50% drugs. I mean, it's a bad situation. And it's another reason why we need to have more programs, not in the masjid. We need field operations. We need people who can go from the masjid into those campuses and as volunteers. So if you, any, any person ever gets a chance to volunteer at an MSA, or if they're having an event, or if they need speakers, be involved in that somewhere because there needs, we need to have that, uh, that, in, that, that, that outreach into those communities. I'll end with that. I know it's nine o'clock, so let's pick up for the navigators, but I'll stick around for about five minutes if there's any final questions because we open up a very important topic. Yes? <laughs> Oh yes, uh, um, uh, yes. So it, it's a similar context to the story of Ibrahim salam where he came to visit uh, Ismail. Ismail was in the valley of Mecca, of Mecca, and he he came, uh, and Ismail was a hunter, so he had gone out to hunt to provide for the family, and Ibrahim salam asked. Um, uh, he, he knocked on the door, and it was it, it was Ismail's wife, and she, he said, "Is Ismail?" He said, "He said no." And she didn't know this is Ibrahim. He said, how are things? How are things going? And she said, oh, it's really bad and everything's bad and, you know, uh, life is bad and the food is bad and this. And he says, okay, just when Ismail comes back, tell him, uh, 
Let him change the um, the atba is the doorman, right? Or the the first step. Yeah, okay, the first step. Tell him to change his doorstep. And so when Ismail came back from hunting, put down his bow, then he said, uh, anything happened today? She said, yeah, an old man came and he asked me how things were going. What did you say? This is what I said. What did he say to you? He said, change your doorstep. He's like, okay, you're divorced. And then another time he came back and he found a woman. Uh, she said, uh, you know, even though it was a harsh life, she's like, life is great. He's, your husband's a great provider. Everything's great. He said, keep your, until, uh, when he comes back, tell him to keep his doorstep. When he came back, same thing went through. And this night he said, that was my father. He told me that I should stay married to you. So yes, thank you for reminding me. That's, that's another story of now a prophet who's looking at a situation and saying, this is not a uh, reasonable situation. I think uh, 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 a, a good correlation would be if somebody if somebody is thinking about divorce and, and they want that, let's just say, prophetic guidance and the shura and the consultation, if they go to professional therapists and counselors who have seen multiple of these cases and they can look at that and they can say, yeah, you're, this, is a, this, is a, this is a difficult situation. They can't, the therapist, of course, can't tell the person to get, to, to get a divorce, but they can offer them the insight maybe to see that this might be this is not necessarily a good situation. So because sometimes, as I mentioned before, divorce is actually an obligation. It's actually logic in the situation. It's actually the better thing to do. But how do we figure that out? That has a process of like dissecting the situation. Was there a question in the back? Yes. Oh, okay, I see. The, the, so the question is there, uh, there's an ayah about uh, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the angels will descend upon them and give them glad tidings. Does this happen at Yom Al-Qiyamah or during the dunya? I'll have to check on the tafsir. So I have to tafsir for the tafsir. Any final questions about uh, the little water day the discussion? Okay, so I'm going to go to the next one.